Do you want to own a SaaS business with high profit margins and low maintenance? Hi, I'm Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast, and today I'm speaking with Pierre Alexander Hertzbeis. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Pierre, after obtaining his MBA from Essex Business School, uh, he completed over 30 deals in his first five years. First as an investment associate, uh, and then as an M&A transaction services consultant at PwC uh, in France and also in Australia. Now, since 2019, he changed to Growing Horizon um, with his business partner, Akil Jabo, and has been focusing on helping you know SaaS businesses and SaaS investors. Now he leads the Horizon Transaction Services Department, providing financial due diligence services to those people, investors, buying SaaS businesses. Now Pierre lives in Portugal, next to Lisbon, loves surfing, kite surfing, playing volleyball in his free time as well. We hit it off with talking surfing at the start of the podcast. But in this podcast episode, Pierre and I specifically talk about how he made that big change and transition from corporate M&A to working with his business partner, Akil, in Horizon, some of the size of the deals they've done DD on, what type of deals, and why it's so important and specialized to have SaaS due diligence done. We do talk about do the due diligence on the software itself, on the actual tech, and how it's how important it is to do due diligence on the tech in itself, and what some of the risks may be with that, and how you can problem solve and resolve those risks or turn those risks into opportunities. We also talk about financial due diligence quite heavily, and Pierre shares some examples of some red flags and things that happen through financial due diligence that we should all be very aware wary of not just in SaaS, but also can be with other business models as well and that can increase the valuation price when it's not actually worth that so i should say inflate instead of increase (laughs) we just talk about risks um, within competitive due diligence we talk about the competitive landscape and how to do due diligence on that market so a bit of market research and the risks within doing these types of deals with those SaaS businesses and how to avoid a bunch of those different risks. There's so much value in this podcast episode on due diligence in itself, let alone due diligence within a SaaS business or for a SaaS business. Now, this is such a valuable episode. You guys are absolutely going to love it. Also note, we spoke so much on due diligence. I want to make sure you get my due diligence framework for free. Before you go away and buy a business, make sure you know how to do due diligence and educate yourself on this. You can get this for free. It's what I and my clients use. We've helped people make millions of dollars and save millions of dollars through this actual tool. And you can get this at buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. There's other awesome resources on that page too. Let's dive in and have a chat with Pierre. Pierre. Thanks for coming on the Buying Online Businesses podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. So just before we got to a, a, um, hitting record buttons, just for everybody listening, Pierre is a mad surf fan, just like me. Uh, used to live in Bondi in Sydney and now lives in a really famous surf town in Portugal, uh, one that I've been able to visit and surf as well. So we just connected on our surfing and our passion for surfing. And Pierre, that was my biggest, my biggest goal was to be able to live anywhere and surf anywhere by getting into this business space. It sounds like it was similar for you, right? It was exactly similar to that. I used to work for a big corporation, PwC. Uh, It was great to learn everything to know about financial analysis and all. But I was at a stage where, you know, I couldn't get the visa in Australia, actually. You know, super hard to get the visa in your country. And so I decided to start as an independent contractor and be able to work uh, remotely just before COVID. So now, now I can basically uh, work based on where the waves are. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's so hard. A lot of people do want to live in Australia and it's very hard to be able to get not just the visa and then also the citizenship and become a residence. It's it's quite difficult. But I'm glad that you're in uh, where you live in Portugal. It's, it is a good spot. Now, let's just dive straight on business. I got so many questions. So you still work for PwC, which is basically a payment merchant is that right no no uh, pwc price waters coopers is one of the big four audit firm so they basically do oh, okay, uh, accounting auditing they, they do transaction services but they also do m a and everything you can think of in terms of consulting they do it like there are uh, there are all, several thousands uh, of people work there they have uh, uh, a presence all over the world but i i used to work for them for five years 
Now, for the past three years, I've worked uh, with Horizon Capital, <clears throat> and we've been focusing mostly on, on SaaS businesses. And so, what caused you to go from from PwC to Horizon? So, well, the, the whole story is uh, after working for five years at PwC, I felt like it was time in my career to move forward and try to try something new. So, I left Australia and started as an independent contractor trying to make it on a fully, ro uh, fully re remote basis. Uh, so that was a bit hard at first, right? It was 2019, so pre-COVID. Pre and when I started doing that, you know, I started I start putting posts on marketplace that connect independent contractors to, uh, to clients. And I get approached by Akil, who had just started Horizon. And uh, we started working together first as a contractor, we really hit, hit it off. I really like the project. You know, it's very entrepreneurial, uh, very creative in his way to approach business. Uh, I was bringing more financial uh, acumen. And so that's really how it started. And uh, now I'm basically a partner of, uh, of Horizon and we're growing it uh, together, trying to develop different activities. Congrats. That's so cool. That's so cool. How so? So since you've done been in Horizon, how many businesses have you been a part of that have been purchased? Like, because they're bigger businesses, there's less volume, um, or what does that what does that look like? Yeah, and, and because over the past three years, like I've done different things as part as part of Horizon, okay. but also get, getting getting personal clients. Uh, so I've been involved doing financial modeling business plans, uh, transaction, financial due diligence uh, for, for investors or buyers, but also M&A advisory. Uh, so overall, I would, uh, I would think I've been involved in around 10, 10 businesses um, uh, and uh, cool. 10 different transactions going through, you know, uh, in one way or, or, or one other. And that made me realize that by doing that, you know, I developed an expertise both in transaction services and financial due diligence from my time at PwC. And during my time at Horizon, since we focus 100% on SaaS businesses, I, I felt like combining both of them and launching a uh, financial due diligence practice solely focused on SaaS businesses would be a big differentiator on the market. Because as you know, with online businesses and SaaS in particular, there are so many specificities uh, in terms of operation metrics, in terms of how they operate, in terms of how they grow, uh, that I feel like it would make a lot of sense, you know, to offer that service and to focus 100% uh, on helping investors and buyers know what they buy. I love that because you're right. There's so many people and especially uh, you guys are, I'm going to ask how much, you know, what size these deals yeah. are in, in a second. Uh, most people listening are buying smaller deals. And when they come, most people come to the space and like, I want to buy an online business. Somebody that's not in online business, what they think of is e-commerce business. That's what I think an, an online business is, True. right? And it's the same at this True. this level where people might be buying businesses between the you know, 10K range to 200, 300K range. Also above, you know, a million plus, most people are like, I want to buy a brand. I want to buy an e-commerce business. For me, yes. that's cringeworthy uh, just because I know how much is involved with it in terms of the different yes. departments and, and stuff like that. And, you know, just through this, through this pandemic period with, uh, logistics it's been a nightmare inflation and cost of goods and things like that it's it's just a it's a lot a lot of moving parts especially as you go up the ladder of how substantial the business is in terms of size i think it's a great idea to have have the difference uh in business models and going straight into you know SaaS dd specific for SaaS because people are going to go buy a SaaS business I'm just going to go want somebody that's just going to do due diligence on all of them. If you're specialized in the field, like what I do when I've injured myself or something, I'm going to go to a specialist. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's a very important thing. And you're right. There's so many intricate things within SaaS that are not within a lot of different types of online businesses, which I want to break down shortly, but what size deals just so people listening know what size deals are we looking at? Like the rough price range. For those ten, so generally for for financial due diligence consultant to to get involved, you start at one hundred k ARR or annual revenue, uh, and go it yep. goes up. Like uh, during my career, I've worked on multi billion dollars deals, uh, but but with Horizon, we are focusing say on the one hundred k to five million, uh, sorry, fifty million 
uh, AR, ARR deals. Cool. So 100K to 15 mil. Yeah, exactly. Because generally below that, I mean, you still you can still do financial due diligence and you need to do due diligence as a whole. But below 100K, honestly, as long as you check that uh, the bank accounts match their financials, uh, and that you check a bit their, their customer and the, that you understand the basics, you're, you're taking less risk, right? If you start getting over 100K and even more so above 1 million, then generally you have a complexity which is uh, much wider and, uh, and much more complex because uh, you start having generally different stream of revenue. You start having different channels. Uh, your cogs are going to be more complicated. Your marketing, your, uh, your marketing channels are going to be different. Your conversion rates are going to be different. Uh, potentially, you're going to sell uh, during, on, on different geographies. So you have way more things and way more pattern to analyze. Um, and that you really need to understand first to make sure you understand the business, but also and foremost to make sure that you don't get screwed and that you've seen all the red flags, uh, if there are any red flags. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Normally, just so you know, and a lot of people listening, most people that are buying businesses in the 10, 20 to 30 plus to yeah. 200 K range, they don't go away and get a CPA, which is what they call in America. Yeah, I'm very, 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 uh, very familiar with the name. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite a simple um, due diligence, financial due diligence to do when you've got one revenue stream from ad revenue. Uh, it can get more complex with e-commerce businesses and multiple products. And I definitely yes. suggest people have a CPA look at the finances on sites above that two hundred ish k range as well, especially above a million dollars. Like you said, it's not just different products, but multiple sales channels in in, in different, uh, and then also the expenses as well uh, for a business like yes. that. So you talked about financial modeling. I want to come to that shortly. But what would you say are some of the most important things that you're looking at when you're doing financial due diligence on, say, a business? You know around the 200 to 500K range or up to a million? It's going to be to sound obvious to say it like that, but you look at the revenue generation, right? So that's going to be your first main important point is understand how revenue are generated. So that means that you, you break it down between volume and price generally, right? Uh, and depending on the business model you're looking at, because if you look at an e-commerce model, it's not going to be the same as if you look at a SaaS business model. Mm -hmm. If you look at a SaaS, for instance, where or any business where you have recurring revenue, recurring clients, you're going to deep dive into understanding the revenue generation per customers. So how long your customers stay? how much it costs you also to uh, to attract those customers and to convert them. How much money do they generate over their lifetime? If you switch to an e-commerce business, you're going to be very careful not only about the revenue generation, uh, but about the margin and the gross margin as well. Because you could you could be selling four million worth of merchandise. If you're if, if you're selling at cost, you know, you, you don't really have a business. And uh, this is the main thing you want to, to look at revenue and how much it costs you to, to generate those revenues. I love it. I love it. A lot of people, uh, when they do due diligence on e-commerce businesses that they submit to us to review is they don't know. And we, this, this is a cross between financial due diligence and also looking at the marketing and the analytics as well. They don't know what CPA is, your cost per acquisition, how much it costs to acquire a customer. Mm -hmm which is so important to understand to know, all right, what, how much money do you need to put in to get the type of return that you want to put in as well? And are there some certain things in the funnel or in the market that you can do to change to decrease that cost per acquisition uh, or increase yes. the price? I think with SaaS and membership businesses, a lot of people don't put enough weight into it depends on what you want to call it. You can call it the churn. You can call it customer lifetime value. There's there's many different names, but I think knowing the customer lifetime value and the churn rate, two really big ones, is that is that part of the due diligence packages that you look at as well? Is looking at like, all right, how long are these people staying in? How much are they paying? What's their lifetime value? You know, when are they likely to leave? What the, what the whole journey looks like? Is that something you piece together with financial due diligence, yeah. or are there some other things at play? Yeah. Yes, it, yes, it is. Uh, it, I think it's even, uh, it's actually one of the key elements we're going to look at during the financial due diligence. 
So I, I think the main thing to understand, which is uh, quite misunderstood on, on the market, and especially when you mentioned, for instance, you know, get a CPA to, uh, to look at your financial, it's great to have a CPA, but I generally do a big difference between CPA, which is more related to auditing your uh, the accounts and understanding whether mm. they've been prepared according to the law and uh, and according to to the financial standard and accounting st standard. Financial due diligence mm. is way more analytic. Like for for instance, I'm not I'm not a CPA, I'm not a CA, charter ac accountant, and most of the people I've worked with at PwC and in, in Big Four in general, who are the guy who do most of the financial due diligence in the world, most of them are not CA, CPA at partner level uh, maybe, but until manager, senior manager, a lot of them don't have an account, like a pure accounting degree, because it's all about yeah. understanding the analytics, under understanding the operation metrics. Uh, deep diving into into the numbers, and at the at the end of the day, when you're giving like a full report, what you're you're saying, you're not just showing the numbers, you're writing and explaining the whole story of the company from a financial perspective. Mm. Which means that mm. when you do that, you also touch base on on the strategy. You explain how the company grew, you know, by focusing on one or, or, or several products how uh, certain product, you know, have a higher margin than, than others and how there was, I don't know, a switch, for instance, in, in the in the number of sales in one specific product, which explain why the margin has decreased over the past two years because uh, people have switched to that product, which is lower margin. So you're really trying to build a story and explain it uh, in plain words on top of deep diving and making sure, uh, of course, everything is in order. I love it. So people can see the full picture. People that don't know how to analyze the financials can see the full picture and understand yes. some of the risk and what those risks would look like if they were to own the business, right? Which is what we try and do with our due diligence on different types of business deals. Cool. But I want to ask you about some, and this is the juicy stuff that people want to hear. What are some of the red flags that you see within the, within the financials? that you're like, oh, this yeah. this is a bit, oh, that's a risk. And what would that risk look like if somebody was to take on those businesses? And maybe there's, you know, two to three, or maybe there's more. What are those? Uh, okay. <laughs> there can be more, way more than three for sure. So the, the first one <laughs> I can think of is, is people trying to present their numbers in a light, which is not uh, well representative of, of how the business is doing. Like I, I actually have like a very good example that happened on one of my deal. Enterprise the company was doing was on the FBA market, so so something you're fairly familiar with, right? So more e-commerce type of things. They were sending a software to 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 customer that were doing e-commerce, and uh, they were reporting on a cash basis, which means that you book your numbers only when they hit your bank account, as opposed to uh, recognize, uh, recognizing a revenue over three years if you have a three-year client, for instance, like that. Over the year, the, uh, the customers, basically the targets, they had had more clients moving from monthly subscription to annual subscription. But since they, they recognize it on a cash basis, that meant that if you had a client who had stayed for six months and moved to an annual uh, basis, in the book, you would have six months of monthly plus the equivalent of 12 months of subscription. So that meant two things. Uh, First, the revenue were overstated. Second, the growth was also overstated. So we, and both things which had like a huge impact on valuation. So in, in summary, the one red flag to, uh, to look for is make sure you understand the accounting and how the number are presented to, to you because uh, it may not reflect um, the what you think is face value. The second thing, Love which it. can can be a red flag, we can be a red flag, is everything around provisions. So I, I I don't know how familiar you are with provision. Basically, provision in accounting is something where uh, I don't know you you have a risk. Uh, uh, you want to recognize an expense um, to so that it hits your PNL, even though the the event that will lead to that expense has not happened yet. So it's just to be prudent, basically cautious about it. So the only issue with that is people use it to manipulate their net profits. Uh, can you give us an example of like a provision expense just so people 
uh, understand this concept. Exactly, exactly. And trying to tie to the e-commerce, for instance, say so you're you're running an e-commerce business, and if you hold your stock, you can have a provision for stock depreciation. Like uh, I don't know, imagine you're selling a high price uh, couch, okay, that sell for five k each. If you add yep. a couch couch in inventory for three years you can kind of make up a provision which is going to be legal to say, okay, this couch hasn't sold for three years. We're going to depreciate it by 30% or 40% of its value. But really, you, you totally know that that couch, even in 10 years, you can still sell it at, uh, at full price, right? And so I've seen companies where people use that as a cushion so that if next year uh, they do less sales or less, less net profit, they release part of the provision, which artificially increase their net profit back. And so you see on several years, you see a constant growth thanks to that. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's a really good one to point out. What are some of the other big ones that you've seen as well? Like, because this is this can decrease, this can not only decrease the the valuation to save the person that's looking at buying the business to save them a lot more money, mm. but also can save them a lot yes. more risk. What are some of those ones that were just like, wow, that's a, that's a huge risk that you've sort of said to a client, like, look, this is a pretty, this is probably too much of a significant risk to go for. Yeah. So the most classic one is revenue concentration, which means that I know 40% of the revenue of the company is made with only one client. When that happens, that means yeah. that you take the risk after buying the business, that client leaves, you just lost 40% of your revenue. And generally, because you have a certain level of fixed cost, if you lose 40% of your revenue, you lose 70 or 80% of your EBITDA. So that, that may mean yeah. most of the cash flow you bought. And, uh, and the second yeah. thing, uh, you should be super careful because in theory, you know, the argument is, which is always used by sellers is, yeah, but that customer has been with us for five years. is very loyal, blah, blah, blah. Sure. The only thing is you don't know what the personal relationship that the seller has with that buyer. Because if they are buddies, mm -hmm. they may be even from the same family, you at high risk is that that customer has been staying only because they have such a great relationship. And the day you buy the business, mm -hmm. then that, that customer may, uh, may leave because of that. That's scary to think about the, and people talk about stickiness in SaaS businesses. The stickiness is yes. tied to a personal relationship rather than the product being so good that their business is tied in mm. and that it's going to be harder for them to leave. We call this uh, single source dependency of revenue or single source. And we have single source dependency of not just revenue, but single source dependency of traffic sometimes where people are only getting traffic from one source yeah. and it gets changed by an algorithm update and they go, oh, wow, like I've just lost all of this traffic, which means when they've lost all of that traffic, they're lost that same usually ends up being similar, same portion percentage wise of revenue that they have lost. Uh, that's really? fascinating. So you are still seeing quite a lot of deals where they have single source dependency on a few customers. Especially the smaller one, like uh, what, what you're mentioning, uh, businesses below 100 K. I mean, it's very common that they rely uh, only on SEO, for instance, or I've seen businesses relying a lot on Facebook ads. And Facebook changed their algorithm a couple of the years ago they, and they, they lost like 30% of their revenue overnight. So clear, clearly having those types of like one channel um, uh, source of revenue can be super, super risky. Yeah, I know the Facebook one very well. Switching from 2018 to 2019, I nearly lost this whole business um, for this the podcast we're talking about due to Facebook and me being so heavily tied into Facebook ads. We were getting a lot of leads, spending a lot of money on ads. I had a sales team, I had a marketing team and we're selling a product that was not actually that scalable uh, at the time. And yeah, it blew up in my face <laughs> and I went backwards for a year just trying to recover. So. Uh, and that was, in hindsight, it was a good lesson to learn because of me not understanding that single source dependency. Now I do, and it's something that not only that I like to teach, but I instill in, in my own businesses. I want to switch gears from financial due diligence. I'm curious around once financial due diligence is, and maybe that financial due diligence doesn't come first, I predict it does, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably most important to see the finances first. What would come next? Is it looking at 
the software? What are some of the other critical components of due diligence for a SaaS business? Yeah, clearly. But generally to answer your first question, generally what we, what we see, each process is different, all right? Uh, but mm. like uh, when, because I also worked in private equity, so I also had that vision of being an investor. So generally speaking, when you're in the first phase of reviewing a business, either as a private equity, a private equity investor, you do that review yourself, you know, so I love a review of financials because that's obviously key to, for, mm -hmm. for, for the valuation, uh, knowing how much debt you need to raise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or second option is you can, <clears throat> you can work with financial due diligence, uh, consultants that will uh, make you a uh, high level red flag report. So that's kind of the two things that we generally do. Either red flag report, which is uh, which is going to include all the essentials, so high level PNL, balance sheets, cash flow, and a quality of earnings, which is um, uh, one of the key pieces of any financial due diligence uh, report. And then during phase two, and phase two most of the time happen once uh, the buyer, the potential buyer, has an exclusivity with the seller. Which means that they are the only yeah. one bidding, uh, and, and, and in a period where they know they can start spending more money on on consultants because they are not going to get the deal stolen by by competitors with a better offer, basically. And so, generally, when when you run a M and A process well, when you get to phase two, which means that you've already made the first financial analysis and you're in that uh, zone of exclusiv exclusivity, you try to run all the due diligence in parallel. Because you want, if you were doing them one by one, you know, the deal would take way too long. And, and if, mm. if you're a professional investor in particular, you're trying to be efficient with your time because then you want to move on to the next deal. If you're not a professional yep. one, Sure, you have less time. However, know that the longer a deal takes, the more chances you have for the deal to, to, to fall through. And so, yeah. generally speaking, in, in SaaS due diligence, yeah, the financial due diligence are super important. The tech due diligence is also very important if you're buying a SaaS product. I guess for an e-commerce product, it would be different, right? Because you don't really have technology, technology involved. Uh, and if sure. you have more time, uh, more money to spend, want to be safer, or you know, try, trying to pay, make a bigger investment, buying a bigger company. Uh, others that can be quite important are the tax due diligence, because uh, uh, sometimes they may, they may have like a huge, uh, huge impact uh, on the deal. Also, legal due diligence, making sure all the contracts are in order, that all the employees are uh, are, are paid according to to the law, and, and that all the taxes are actually uh, paid as well. And an important, mm. important one is a market due diligence. It's, which is also called commercial due diligence. So while tax, legal, fi financial and tech due diligence have a tendency to focus on the company, the market due diligence is going to look at the market on which the company is operating. So they will look at competitors, yeah. how competitors perform, uh, what are the different country you could expand, for instance. Uh, they will also look, you know, at your different products and potentially make recommendations on which products you should focus all your, uh, your attention on uh, and so on. So good. I guess, and there's so many things I want to break down. So thanks for that explanation. Sure. I guess the tax thing would be important for the business owner that is purchasing it is understanding what sort of taxes and how much taxes they would be paying if they were to have the business run through their own home country versus maybe if I bought something and I was going to run it through Australia, um, an Australian company versus a US company, but also have US employees, what that would look like. So I'm sure there's a lot to dive into there, but I want to touch on two two very, very important things. The technical due diligence, which I guess is around the software, which I think is Yes. which I think is fascinating. I want, to, I want to touch on that. Before I do competitive due diligence or what you call market due diligence, we actually call that competitive due diligence. And I've found that, especially on the smaller deals, that a lot of people looking for SaaS businesses go away and find a business that can actually be... The risk is that that business is a, or it's a software that is basically a benefit or could be a benefit of a bigger 
bigger company. For example, if somebody came out with um, some a feature or a benefit that Zoom didn't have and they sold it as a soft software and Zoom started to use that as a software or started to use that, add that as a benefit for free to Zoom, that other business would quite easily and quickly go out of business. So there's a massive risk there. Do you see much of that yes. with competitive due diligence? And then what other things do you, what other things do you look at as well? Yeah, you, you clearly have that as a big risk, but honestly, I would say this is a risk with 95% of the software business you buy because Google is there, yeah. Facebook is there. So technically they have the yeah. best engineer in the world. If they decided to go on your market, they would do it. But also yeah. what you see as a risk can also be an opportunity because if you see those big guys interested or lacking that piece of software, that means that if you're looking to sell your business in five years or down the road, they may yeah. actually yeah. be very good strategic buyer. Right. So it's kind, of, it's kind of the two sides of, of, of the, of the same coin. The other thing yeah, you that. look at when you're doing your commercial due diligence is going to look at the prices of, of your competitors, right? And see how well you're positioned to your competitors. Uh, in, in short, mm. if, if you're familiar with uh, the work of McKinsey, uh, BCG consulting, Bain and company, they're specialized in commercial uh, due diligence. So all the fancy metrics, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to show if you're a cash co or how your position on the market uh, on, on very fancy uh, charts, you know, uh, uh, where you are on different axes. This is all what commercial due diligence is about. Really understanding your positioning compared to your competitors, uh, your strengths, your weaknesses, your threats. Uh, and, and all of that. There's so much that goes into commercial due diligence. I want to touch on, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I do want to touch on the tech due diligence. I called it software due diligence, basically understanding the software and knowing, I think a risk is not knowing how up to date the software is and then how many yes. things that need to be plugged up and fixed, which is my major concern for somebody that says, hey, Jared, I want to buy a software business. And I ask them, how much do you know about software and can you audit the tech? What, what are some of the big components? What are some of the biggest risks, I guess, uh, that you need to identify and point out when doing tech DD? Well, basically on tech DD, honestly, that's not my, my core skills uh, simply because I'm not a tech guy. Like I have tech sensitivity, yeah. I've learned Python and, and the basics, but I'm not the one doing yeah. that. Like we have a partner actually handling that. However, if I had like to, to take the two or three main things, generally understand who wrote the code, because if only one person in the company wrote the code, that generally means that everything depends on that person. So mm. you need to be extra careful and, and check how well documented the code is. Because I've, I've seen that in, in companies doing over 5 million in, re, in revenue per year. Uh, there was like one guy maintaining the, the code base he had nothing documented. So basically the whole company was re uh, reliant on that guy and you don't want that. And then the second thing is ask an expert to tell you whether the technology which is used <coughs> is the right one, is there is a more, uh, more, um, sorry, more efficient one. Uh, try to see how clean the code is because obviously, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of like in mathematics. In mathematics, you can, you can do one plus one as one plus three minus two plus one uh, and get to the same result. But it's way more yeah. complex than just doing one plus one e equal two. So someone who is an expert in code review will tell you whether the code is efficient, uh, if it runs well. Uh, I'm, uh, you can also check the number of bugs. Oh, and, and actually, if you're not a tech guy, even before hiring anyone, a good way to know whether the technology is good or not, just ask for log report or, or look at how many customers complain or have issues with the software per week. And that will give you a very good indication of how buggy or how well done the software is. Yeah, that's really good. Asking for feedback and, and looking at the reviews. That's also a really good thing to have as your arsenal for growth in changing and updating and making the software better so people stay longer. Um, so yeah. the code thing is interesting. Um, 
the single source dependency on one person, like that's a really good example. I'll, I'll, I, what concerns me sometimes with SaaS businesses and a lot of businesses is something that's built on a certain platform. And if the team doesn't come along with the business and um, you have to get other people in to try and understand the code, you have a big expense of people having to try and understand that software and then change it because most most often is this the case is most most SaaS businesses are custom built like most of the software is custom made but on on a platform mm -hmm. well sorry what do you mean custom built you mean for the customers or custom made yeah no like built like from it's, what, it's, from a, what it's a brand like it's on it's on say like python or, or, a, or a, a different of like a type of code but most of the SaaS businesses are built specifically for that type of business model Right. So then there's yep. going to be somebody else that has to cr come in and try and understand it, which, which means that if you don't have the team that comes along with the business, you will have to pay a lot more hours towards somebody to first understand it before they know how to change it or alter or fix it. Yeah. Well, and basically is there is like not a, but there's not a straight answer on, on, on how SaaS businesses are built because basically a SaaS business is, by definition is just something which you uh, like a software piece of software you can you can use online and for which you pay a subscription basically but now especially mm -hmm. with all the no code tools that exist you know you can build a whole online application and all online software using no code uh, no yeah. code uh, as in sorry, drag and drop uh, type of things like wix or or bubble for, for instance right so as long as you're able to code you can do it in python you can do it in react in javascript in any type of, of coding and any type of environment as long as your software is mm -hmm. online on the cloud then it, it, you can make a SaaS business out of it uh, but for yeah. sure if the team is not coming uh, and you're just buying the, so the, the software, which happens a lot when you buy very small software, say one, below 100K, uh, general, generally you're buying it from the person who's developed it or who paid someone to develop it. And if you're trying to take it over, then you better make sure that first there is a transition period with the, uh, with the previous owner so that you, you can really get a grasp of, of the code and how to make it work. And you likely need to factor the cost of developers to maintain the code base if you're not a developer yourself, which is quite important to factor within the price you're going to pay for your, uh, for your software. Uh, maybe you don't know, but maybe you do. Where are most of the deals that, that you guys are doing DD on? Where are they coming from? Where are people finding them? Are they, are they private or is there a marketplace that you've seen a few from? Like what's, what's the most common place people find these businesses that are up for sale? The, again, it depends what type of buyers. If you're talking about private equity buyers, which are the one who make the most deal per, per year, they have their own source of deals. A uh, lot, lot of them source their deal through M&A brokers also, uh, who have their own uh, own channels. However, for for private buyers, you have more and more marketplace uh, where you can find uh, really great deals. Like uh, the most recent one, which is super co top quality, is Micro Acquire. I, I guess you may have heard of it in uh, in America. It's been uh, launched by Andrew Gasdecki great entrepreneurs mm. and basically he created his whole platform with entrepreneurs uh, in mind first. So he's like, you have a business, let's switch, uh, um, let's switch the position and the leverage. I want to be the platform for the entrepreneur to sell their business and not for buyers to buy those businesses. But he managed to create mm. something with uh, super quality uh, deals and, and pretty cool uh, websites as well. And then you have other platforms, broker platforms, where you get, can go to. You can even subscribe, you know, to daily emails or weekly emails, so that as they reach out to you. But generally speaking, the best deals are the one as a buyer are the one that are not brokered because you're more likely to have less competition and, and pay a lesser price. Mm -hmm. But they're also uh, also super hard to find. Yeah, I agree. People that have a business that they want to sell that know it's valuable, they know that they could go away and sell it not needing a broker as well <laughs> because it's a valuable business and they'll be able to find people sometimes sometimes that's a mistake though uh, i i feel i feel like a lot of people feel like they don't need a broker or a m a advisor because they don't realize all the work which is done by m a advisors 
So some, sometimes mm. it's true, right? So sometimes you can end up with brokers who are literally just going to list your website uh, and, and be there on, on three calls and you're going to do most of the work. But especially when the deal start getting bigger and bigger, having a third person here uh, to manage the whole process, help you with the negotiation, help you uh, manage the due diligence and save you a lot of times because you don't have to deal with all the admin can, can be super valuable as well. Yeah. For sure. I'm one of those people that would be using a, a, an M&A broker for sure. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not something that excites me having to get the business, all the data and information and access and all those sorts of things sorted. This has been awesome, Pierre. Where, where can we people to find, send people to find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah. So uh, either on, on LinkedIn, happy to, always happy to connect on LinkedIn. And also they can come directly to our website, www.horizonvenkapital.com, uh, where, where you can see the different uh, type of services that, uh, that we offer. And uh, in particular, if you ever need financial due diligence, like you can reach out directly to me by email at pierre at horizoncapital.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Everybody that is listening, thank you for listening. What I would love for you to do is if you know somebody that's looking buying a SaaS business, share this podcast episode with them. It helps Pierre, helps me, it helps us all to learn a, more, learn a lot more and help us have more impact. Thanks so much, guys. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video was good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.